Want your picture on the screen? Well, it's not an easy game winning fame as a movie queen. If you want to be an actress, huh, it's more trying than you know. Living at your public call, giving all for your studio. Appointments here, appointments there, no sooner than you wake up with wardrobe, stills, and makeup. Oh, what a time they take off. They fix your gown, they dress your hair, they primp you up to show you the work's enough to throw you. Your mother wouldn't know you, so you want to be in movies like a lot of others do. Well, just take a look at me and you'll see what a girl goes through. So you want to be in movies, well, the laugh's on you. Hi, I'm David Steinberg. In the crazy world of show business, publicity has always been the key to success. I don't mean just advertising, but a special kind of showmanship that triggers the imagination. It's something that the press agents call ballyhoo. It all started when the first con man sold the sizzle and not the steak. This hype reached epic proportions in the heyday of Hollywood when everyone wanted to be in the movies. Uh, this was before television, and the star system was at its peak. Hollywood was a place where dreams came true, or seemed to come true. Where else could you become a sensation overnight? Rich, famous, and adored. For over 30 years, Hollywood gave a party, and just about everyone wanted to come. It was a world of make-believe, where the stars were gods and goddesses in a movie land Olympus, and the fans paid homage to beauty, glamour, and talent. As far as the public was concerned, Hollywood was a magical kingdom where anyone could be a star, if only you were lucky. The latest news from the land of the stars. A new motion picture star, Sonia Haney, the Norwegian lass who is the world's greatest figure skater and winner of three Olympic gold medals. She has captured and captivated audiences with her grace and beauty on the ice, and now she will capture and captivate them with her grace and beauty on the screen. Here's how a motion picture star is created as Daryl Zanuck, producing chief of 20th Century Fox, signed Sonia Haney to her contract. She is to star in Zanuck's productions, flashing her grace on the screen as she has done in the Olympic arena. Miss Haney, it is indeed a pleasure to know that you have accepted this contract to star in 20th Century Fox Pictures and I have every reason to believe that you will achieve on the screen the same international success that has made you the greatest ice skater and the most popular young lady in the world of sport. Thank you, Mr. Sanic. I shall do my best. Fine. A girl loves a movie contract better than winning an Olympic event. Isn't it so, Sonia? Smile that contract signing smile. Star of the ice and of the screen. The studios publicized their contract players in newsreels, fan magazines, and newspapers. Columnists like Luella Parsons, Hedda Hopper, and Jimmy Fiddler fed the public the latest news from Tinseltown. The fans thought they were getting the lowdown on their favorite star, but in reality, Hollywood was in the business of creating an image. Scandal was swept right under the press agent's carpet. Everything was carefully staged and coyly performed for the public. Will Mary Pickford marry Buddy Rogers? This question has been answered at last. There will be wedding bells for America's sweetheart sometime in the spring. The movie tone cameraman finds the future Mr. and Mrs. Rogers at a polo match. Any plans, bud? Well, I have, uh, I mean, we have lots of plans, haven't we, Mary? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the big boss better tell you all about the plans. Well, we're going to build a ranch in the valley where Bud can keep his polo ponies. Well, thanks, May. What are you going to do while I'm busy with the ponies? Well, I hadn't told you before, but uh, I thought I'd like to have an airplane. Oh, yeah? Yeah, if you don't mind. You're going to take the air? Yeah. Well, just so you don't give it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not to you. Thanks. Mary, Buddy, and the wedding cake. And there are cameramen from everywhere for this Hollywood event. Congratulations, father to son, after the wedding of Mary Pickford and Buddy Rogers, a garden ceremony at Bel Air, California. 
the bride kisses mother-in-law. They've known each other for a long time, the famous star of the screen and the actor band leader of films and radio. Their engagement often rumored, and now honeymoon in Honolulu. During the Depression, the world was movie crazy, especially would-be stage mothers. When Selznick Studio was casting Tom Sawyer, over 3,000 youngsters showed up for the cattle call in hopes of becoming another Jackie Cooper. Okay, Hoppo, Sasha, you boys know the rules. No cutting in on curves or over speed. So, are you ready? Jackie Cooper was the first big child star of the 30s, the perennial Skippy, adored by millions of fans all over the world. On screen, he was publicized as the boy next door, a kid who liked to race around the Paramount lot with the Marx Brothers, or clown with Mickey Rooney and director W.S. Van Dyke. All right, kids, now on your mark. Now ready, wait for the gun. Ready, set. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Now don't jump till I give you the word. Wait, wait till you get the gun. Wait till you get the gun, all of you. Hear me, Jackie? But off screen, he lived a more adult life. According to his autobiography, at age 13, he was already sexually active with some of his mother's closest friends. Hardly your typical teenager. But then Hollywood wasn't your typical hometown either. Where else could a boy like Jackie Cooper have an affair with 35-year-old Joan Crawford while he was still in high school? Obviously, the motto was, what the public didn't know couldn't hurt the box office. After all, child stars were big business, especially Shirley Temple. Once upon a time when I was very young, I was very happy. first worked in pictures, I used to get awful worried about all the troubles. I wish all the bad things in the world could turn out to be just pretending. But this is happening. It's not a make-believe flood. And these people are really and truly getting hurt. But my mommy told me about some people who helped. The American Red Cross. I'm all dressed up like one of them. Whenever there's trouble, they're right there to help people. And they give them clothes to wear. And they feed them. It costs a whole dollar to join. And that's an awful lot of money. But won't you please try hard to find that much? So as you can help? Shirley Temple was the movie's top box office attraction. And she handled the publicity game like a showbiz veteran. Waikiki Beach, a new lifeguard ready in case any 300-pounder should get into trouble in the surf. Inducted into the beach patrol, sweater decorated with the beach emblem. She'll still do a little acting on the side, but right now the little colonel wants to be a little captain. Thank you, Captain Hill. I'd like to be honorary captain of the Waikiki Beach. She inspects her life-saving buddies. So I'm here to find life-saving. Tickled with everything. We gathered here today to unveil a, a picture of you here. Now, I'm not going to make a speech, because I'm so long-winded, I make speeches for everywhere for no reason whatever. And you are the biggest entertainer in the world today. And you have arrived at that position by not making speeches. So a painting of Shirley is unveiled in the Fox Studio dining room in Hollywood. The celebrated star is six, has a party, and makes a speech. I want to thank you very much. I think it's very nice to have a big party like this. Frosty ice cream and sugary cake make a happy birthday. People are calling Shirley by the title of her next picture, Our Little Girl. Six candles are a lot for a famous actress to blow out. It's Shirley Temple, and she has a brand new play toy. A real automobile so tiny it might have been made for Tom Thumb. Off she goes in a cloud of smoke. What, no smoke? Well, at any rate, she's the Barney Oldfield of Hollywood. They won't let Shirley drive on the open highway. They're afraid of those road hogs. 
In the studio, she travels from stage to stage. Every cop has special orders to give her the right of way over all traffic, even the fire department. Now back to her bungalow dressing room. And after all my praise, Shirley starts and stops the car all by herself. You see, she gets out behind to stop it. Most cars, you get out behind to push. Shirley Temple was lucky. Thanks to her parents, she had had a happy childhood. But there were others who didn't. When Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney arrived in New York in 1939 to plug their latest movie, she was already on Dexedrine, or speed as it's known today, in an effort to keep her energy up and lose weight. On this trip, Judy and Mickey were doing eight shows a day at the Capitol Theater, not to mention interviews and outside commitments like appearing at the World's Fair with Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Go ahead, Mickey. Well, I have a lot of friends around uh, out where I live out on the coast, and they'd like to come and visit the World's Fair, but I want to ask you if there's any place that they could stay other than the Park Avenue Hotel. Why, sure, Mickey. New York City's like every other town in this country. Except that we can give you better accommodation and better food for less money. <laughs> now they can come here, and uh, Judy, you have friends too, haven't you? Yes, I have. Now you can tell the boys and girls, the uh, high school students, that they can come to New York and get accommodations, safe, sanitary, cheerful, inspected rooms, all the way from 50, 75 cents a night. And if they come in groups, we can give, the, give to them as cheap as 50 cents a night. Oh, as Mr. Mayor, that looks like we're going to move in. <laughs> you better not. You move in, you tell the kids, and, hey, what do you think of this fair? Isn't it great? It's really wonderful. It didn't matter if Mickey and Judy were in New York or Hollywood. The cameras were always turning in their direction. This was Judy's 16th birthday and she publicized it at Louis B. Mayer's Santa Monica Beach Home with her friends Jackie Cooper and Mickey Rooney. Kids, my, uh, my first dive will be a full soldier duck, a half old. Watch. <laughs> By this time, Rooney was well on his way to becoming the nation's top box office draw in movies like Boys Town, and the Andy Hardy series. And Judy was getting ready to star in her next film, The Wizard of Oz, with Ray Bolger, Burt Lahr, and Buddy Epson. That's right, Buddy Epson was cast as the Tin Man until he developed respiratory problems and had to be replaced by Jack Haley. Judy and Mickey were publicized as the All-American Kids, and they played their role to perfection. She was the unspoiled girl next door, and he was the irrepressible Andy Hardy. May I have two cones, please? Uh -huh. And I'd like a diamond change, too. Are you saving them, Mickey? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give mine to President Roosevelt. The president? Why, well, Mickey? Yes, you see, Judy, I've got my envelope made out right here. It's all ready to go. See for yourself. Oh, I know. That's a march of dimes, the infantile paralysis fund. That's right. And, Judy, when I spend a dime on myself for some little luxury like this, I always think about those unfortunate kids and how far just a dime will go toward helping them. Gee, Mickey, we don't know how lucky we are and how much we have to be thankful for with our health and our happiness. Judy, and that's why we should do all that we can to help all of those who can't help themselves. I know. Can I put a dime in your envelope? Oh, you know that you can. And that's what every good American should do. Join the March of Dimes. Send yours to President Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Washington, D.C. The role of a child star was just that, a role to be played for studio profits and the public's pleasure. The work could be exhausting. Movies, radio, recording dates, and personal appearances, not to mention school, left little time for a normal life. The studio created an image of wholesomeness and glamour, and the press agents supplied an unending stream of copy for the gossip columnists. Hello, everybody. This is Hedda Hopper reporting to you from Hollywood, that fabulous place where everyone wants to live but seldom does. Hollywood, whose celebrities were discovered in Centerville, who live in Beverly Hills, work in Culver City, and play in Palm Springs. Hollywood wanted publicity, and the columnists wanted the latest scoop for their newspapers and radio programs, which publicized the life of the stars. 
their romances, their successes, the adulation, something the average fan could fantasize. When depression workers were lucky to be making $1,000 a year, the stars were earning as much as $1,000 a day, and they knew how to spend it. The stars flaunted their wealth, and the public loved it. Hollywood was America's dream of success. Everyone was a fan, even the stars themselves. Uh, Dante, uh, who, who are you two-timing with tonight there, that stranger? Well, Charlie, I'm with Tyrone Power. Oh. Oh, hello, Tyrone. Why, you're Ty. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, so I am. Uh, who are you supposed to be, Charlie? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, who am I? Oh, you're a minstrel man. Yeah, I'm a minstrel man. Mm, the end man? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm the last of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, boss, it's uh, not bad. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, you got the wrong guy. I'm one of the rich brothers. <coughs> still not bad. No, uh, still not bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Uh. Hollywood loved the spotlight, but every public appearance combined business with pleasure. And signing autographs was one of the rituals of being a star. Say, buddy. You really want the autographs of those stars? I sure do. Well, I'll get them for you. Will you sign for this now, Mr. Chaplin? Yes, they have all of them. All right. Wow. Thank you very much. There's nothing in there. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I have a uh, message for you, Mr. Donald. You sign here, please. I'm Anna Hill tonight. I'm not Mr. Donald. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Raft, here's a letter for you. And if you'll sign, Miss Harlow. The Mr. Hell Raft. Hey, Mr. Raft. Thank you. Thank you. Sam? Yo. Mr. Raft, you'll sign for Mr. Raft. Uh, maybe he can get a little bit of a Every movie event was a publicity showcase. When Max Factor opened his new headquarters in 1936, 14-year-old Judy Garland wished him luck, and so did 17-year-old Margarita Consino, later known as Rita Hayworth. Hollywood was the movie capital of the world, the playground of the stars where making a public appearance was almost as important as making a film. While the cameras clicked and the fans looked on in amazement, the stars arrived in chauffeur-driven limousines, each one trying to outdo the other. One critic said, the stars would turn out for the opening of a drugstore if it was publicized, and in this cartoon, they did. Sometimes a cartoon turned comedy into satire when it dealt with movie protocol. Even at a drugstore opening, the stars expected the red carpet treatment and the fans' undivided attention. Hello, folks. Hello, Samson. Greetings and salutations, you guys and gals. This is the old maestro and all the land, bringing you a program of dance music from the Coconut Grove, Yowza. My, oh my, just look at all the celebrities. Hollywood didn't mind a little fun at its own expense, but in a cartoon, they were held up to ridicule. No one was safe. The bigger the name, the bigger the joke. And audiences love to see Hollywood lose its dignity. Oh, her beautiful hand you have, Miss Hartburn. Cartoons reinforced the idea that nightclub openings, parties, and personal appearances were part of the glamour and excitement of Hollywood. 
But when it came to real showbiz ballyhoo, nothing compared to the big movie premiere. Everyone who was anyone was invited. The studio press agents saw to that. And they were all expected to praise the film and its star. In this case, superstar Deanna Durbin, a Canadian singer whose films made over $100 million for Universal and saved the studio from bankruptcy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I just take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for making me just about the happiest young lady in the world. Thank you again. Thank you, Deanna Durbin. I'm sure that you've made a great many people very, very happy, too. May we present for just a word gentleman who is here to see this opening of another Deanna Durbin picture, Mr. Tyrone Power. Hi. Want me to say something? Please, here? won't you? Coming to see a Deanna Durbin picture is always a pleasure, and I'm sure this evening is going to be no different. Thank you. It's lovely to be here attending Deanna's inevitable ninth success out of a possible night. The movie premiere was a show business institution, with the stars the center of attention. But it was the public that created the excitement and the spectacle when they turned out for Filmland's biggest premiere, the 1931 opening of Howard Hughes' Hell's Angels. Hell's Angels, the opening of this picture at Raman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood was the biggest premiere ever seen anywhere in the world before or since. 500,000 people are lining the street. Gene Harlow. I would like to use this occasion to publicly thank Mr. Hughes for the opportunity he gave you. Thank you. The studio knew how to put on a show that would rival the pageants of ancient Rome, and money was no object when it came to selling a movie. When MGM decided to premiere Gone with the Wind in Atlanta, Georgia, the studio persuaded the governor of the state to declare a three-day holiday before the movie's opening, and Atlanta closed all its schools and public buildings on the day of the premiere. The publicity reached such proportions that it pushed World War II off the front pages for two days. Ladies and gentlemen, I've spent quite a good deal of my time on Peachtree Street this year. And now that I'm here, it feels well, just as if I were coming home. And the warmth and kindness of your wonderful welcome has made it the happiest homecoming I could possibly imagine. I greet you and I want to thank you with all my heart. No other picture ever received as much free publicity as Gone with the Wind especially when producer David O'Selznick was looking for someone to play Scarlett O'Hara. For over a year, the public was told who was testing for the part, and it looked like Paulette Goddard was the final selection until Vivian Lee was introduced to Selznick two days into production. But she got the part by making a screen test, like any newcomer. If you were up for a role, the producer wanted to see how you looked on camera. When Hollywood staged a screen test for a movie audience, it was transformed into a big production number. When a star is born, Janet Gaynor played a farm girl who was overwhelmed by all the studio excitement. You'll soon know your name, Esther. The whole world's going to know it. But I'm so scared. Maybe I'd better not try it today. Oh, oh, come on, now don't be foolish. They all had to go through this. Harlow, Lombard, Myrna Loy, and now Esther Blodgett. This is a the movies perpetuated the myth that the screen test was the first step to stardom. But for every winner, there were a thousand losers. Rather an unusual time and place to have a test made. But after I talked with Mr. Lemley this morning, and he graciously offered me this opportunity of making a test, I naturally feel very grateful. I uh, guess you want to know a little bit about what I've been doing. Last year, Mr. Zinn and Mr. Turney made some tests of me at Universal. Evidently, they they submitted them to some of the officials for, well, after several days, they requested that I come back out to the studio to sign a contract. At that time, however, I didn't feel that I was really equipped and had the foundation in the background to enter the movie business. And strange as it may seem, I refused to sign the contract. This summer, I've been studying with Elsie Fogarty at the Royal Albert Hall in London. And uh, 
with H. St. Bob West at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. I have been for the last year a pupil of Gilmore Brown's at the Pasadena Playhouse, Pasadena, California. Uh, I feel now that with this hard study and the experience that I've had, that I, I really am equipped now with the foundation so that if a contract were offered me, I could accept it. I hope you'll overlook the fact that this test is being made on a, a rocking boat. That I have no makeup on. It's nature in the raw. There's no lighting. The sound must be pretty bad, but, uh, but remember that in a studio with uh, proper lighting and a good makeup and some facilities for a screen test and one of Universal's excellent directors, I'll make a much nicer impression. If a number of actresses were testing for a particular movie, it was usually reported in all the newspapers. Although the public seldom, if ever, saw the tests, the constant speculation about who was going to get the part was a great way to publicize the picture. This way, there were months of anticipation and word-of-mouth advertising. When David O. Selznick was looking for the right girl to play the part in Rebecca, every movie fan knew that Vivian Lee, Joan Fontaine, and Loretta Young were testing for the part. Darling, I wanted to tell you before, but I didn't have the chance. I broke the china cupid. You did? Well, why didn't you say so when Frith was here? Well, I, I wanted to, but I, I even started to, but somehow I didn't get the chance. It doesn't matter. But you will have to explain to Mrs. Daniels. I'll call her. Oh, Maxim, you tell her. I'll go upstairs. Oh, nonsense. Anyone would think you were afraid of her. No, I'm not exactly afraid of her, but I... Oh, I can't tell exactly what I mean. Vivian Lee was still working on Gone with the Wind when she made the test with her future husband, Laurence Olivier, who was already signed really for the things. picture. That's your job. Darling, I, I meant to tell you, but I didn't. I broke the cupid myself. I'm awfully sorry. It was terribly careless of me. Oh, you did? Well, why didn't you say something about it when Frith was here? I started to, but somehow I didn't get a chance. It doesn't matter. We'll have to explain to Mrs. Danvers. That's all I've called. Oh, no, no. Please, Maxim, will you tell her and let me go upstairs? Nonsense. Anybody would think you were afraid of her. I'm not afraid, exactly. It's not that. I can't really explain. When the role finally went to Joan Fontaine, a relatively unknown actress, Olivier was upset. Oh, uh, darling, I, I was going to tell you, but I, I didn't get the chance. I broke the china cupid. You did? Well, why didn't you say so? Perhaps? Well, I wanted to. I, I started to, but I... Well, it doesn't matter, but you'll have to explain to Mrs. Danvers. I'll call her. Oh, no, Maxim, you tell her. I'll, I'll go upstairs. Oh, nonsense. Anyone would think you were afraid of her. Well, I'm not exactly afraid of her. I don't really know how to explain. Once an actress was chosen for a leading role, the studio press agents began to turn her into a star name, hey, ready? like Veronica right. Lake of the Peekaboo Hair. Hello, Jeff. Why haven't you called? Oh, I've been busy. Oh, you can't be so busy. I hear there's a dance out there tonight. I thought we were going to be intelligent about it. What does that mean? Goodbye, good luck, we've had our fun, you go your way, I'll go mine. Don't try and sell me that routine, Jeff. You drop up at my place after that dance or I'll start making a few plans of my own. I'm expecting you. Okay, lunch one hour, boys. Studios knew that every performer needed a constant stream of showbiz ballyhoo to keep public interest alive. Hollywood not only hyped the stars, but the star directors as well like Alfred Hitchcock, who always appeared briefly in each of his films. In Mr. and Mrs. Smith, his walk-on was directed by his leading lady, Carol Lombard. Another man who knew how to promote his movies was Cecil B. DeMille, the most famous director in the history of motion pictures. New townspeople over beyond the gate there. Now, as these crusaders come riding through, they're seeing a great movement, a great sweeping forward of these men who are leaving you, perhaps for all time. They're your fathers, your brothers, your husbands. Let me see that in your faces. Come on now, work yourselves into, into the emotion of such a scene. Don't be extras. Be a nation, watching its manhood ride out on a great cause. The crusade, right? Camera! DeMille built his reputation as the master director of movie spectacle. 
someone who never made an unsuccessful film. Some critics said he never made a good one, but he knew the value of showbiz ballyhoo. <laughs> Neil began his professional life as an actor and appeared in many of the promotional trailers for his films, as did another movie giant, Walt Disney. Horse names fit their personalities. This pompous looking individual is Doc, the self appointed leader of the group. And this little fellow is bashful. He's secretly in love with Snow White. And this funny face is Sneezy. He has hay fever. And old droopy eyes is called Sleepy. I'm happy here with the beaming smile. And old sourpuss here is grumpy, the woman hater. And last but not least is Dopey. He's nice, but sort of silly. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was one of the most successful films that Disney made during a career that earned him an international reputation and 30 Academy Awards. And he wasn't shy when it came to self-promotion. In the world's film capital is the studio that stands as a monument to the great genius of Walt Disney, master of a new form of popular art that has captivated millions of moviegoers. With the antics of his entrancing animated cartoon characters, he has built an enterprise that employs 700 skilled and highly specialized artistic workers. Upon the simple theory of animation, a new art has been created. Cartoons are drawn in different poses as on the pages of a book. Riffle the pages and the cartoons go into action. Next, the pencil sketches are photographed a single sheet at a time. Then the film is viewed on a small projection machine called a moviola by the cutters who put the various sequences together in a preliminary story. Now in the projection room, the rough story and penciled animation is reviewed. And as the component parts of the production are shaping up, artists are at work painting the stage settings of the animated cartoon story, the backgrounds done in watercolor. Over these paintings, the finished celluloids are placed to make the completed pictures. As each individual picture becomes a finished composition with background and overlays, it's ready to be photographed for one frame of motion picture film. And so a distinctively American form of art comes to life. Promotional trailers have always been a good way to sell a movie. With millions of dollars riding on every production, the studios used every possible approach to advertise their product. When a motion picture company went on location, they filmed behind the scenes footage to give audiences an idea of how much work went into the filming of an epic production like The Charge of the Light Brigade. Sometimes a trailer for a film was a mini production number with a little sex on the side. When Jeanette MacDonald sang the title song from her latest picture, Love Me Tonight, the setting, the song, and the singer gave audiences a very personal invitation to see the movie. Ballyhoo took a new turn during the Depression years when Warner Brothers decided to inaugurate the publicity train, 
or the movie junket to advertise the movie musical 42nd Street. It was simple. Hire a train, call it the 42nd Street Special, load it with salaried players like Betty Davis and Joey Brown, and send them across the country selling the public on the idea that prosperity was just around the corner. And oh yes, they did mention the name of the movie too. There she is, Warner Brothers 42nd Street Special, pulling into the Union Station direct from little old Broadway with a million dollars worth of movie stars aboard. And it's Joe Brown and Betty Davis. Here they go in the parade through the Chicago streets. It's all Tom Mix can do to push that horse king of his through the crowd. And there's pretty Betty Davis. Yep, she's in the first car. And if you don't think Tom and Betty and all the rest of them are grade A favorites, look at the movie fans crowding that parade. The 42nd Street special is taking the Warner Brothers stars from 42nd Street and Broadway to the inauguration in Washington by way of Chicago. The movie junket is a surefire way to generate millions of dollars of free publicity for very little money. This was the turnout for Errol Flynn and some of his fellow players when they arrived in Reno, Nevada to ballyhoo his latest western, Virginia City. There were plenty of girls and plenty of drinks to ensure a good review, and the studios always invited the press. In the 20s, the studios staged similar parades to publicize their new movie season. What they lacked in excitement, they more than made up for in unintentional humor. Every new movie needed a publicity gimmick. When Rudolph Valentino, the greatest lover of them all, finished his last movie, Son of the Sheik, the press agents came up with a new twist, the medical approach. What better way to prove that Valentino could raise a young girl's blood pressure? A short time later, Valentino died and public grief turned into mass hysteria. Newspapers printed fake pictures of Valentino lying in state and in heaven before the day of his funeral which became the most publicized show business event of the 20th century and brought forth a flood of human emotion that couldn't be controlled. Some women committed suicide when they heard of the great lover's death, but after the initial shock was over, showbiz ballyhoo returned to normal. In 1925, MGM took audiences behind the scenes of their new production, Pretty Ladies, and the public got its first glimpse of a budding starlet, Lucille LeSueur. You know her as Joan Crawford. No wonder they changed her name. In French, Lucille LeSueur means Lucille the Sweat. You're trying to force me in the same country. Ten years later, when Joan Crawford was one of the most famous women in the world, her studio was still promoting her screen image and keeping her name before the public. All right. You must have it. I did go to see him. I had told Jerry Darren nothing. Don't you see, I couldn't let him know what a rotten, worthless thing I was because I might lose him. Sometimes Jobis Ballyhoo added a political note. When President Roosevelt took office in 1933, Jobis Ballyhoo combined with political Ballyhoo to advertise the New Deal. The poor boy has fallen asleep. He's been writing a song for the NRA. There's nothing like a good song to inspire a nation. Things are getting better every day. Well, Abe, it looks as though we can stop worrying about our country. President Roosevelt has it headed right again. All it needed was a plan of action and a man with the courage to put it through. There isn't a person in America who won't profit by the National Recovery Administration if every man, woman, and child will do his part. You can always depend upon Americans. Did I hear... Did I hear someone mention NRA? Oh. I didn't realize who you were. You see, I've just been writing a patriotic song. I must have fallen asleep. Don't excuse yourself, my boy. I know the NRA is a great thing for America. But you see, I hardly know exactly how it operates. What will it do? It will end unemployment and restore the purchasing power of the American people. 
the thing this country has been trying to do for many years. Oh, great. Tell me more about it, will you? The more people buy, the more things the manufacturers will have to make, and the farmers will have to grow, and the road to better times will be open again. Why, that's it. That's an idea for my song. Listen, here it is. There's a new day in view. There is gold in the blue. There is hope in the hearts of men. All the world's on the way to a sunnier day. For the road is open again. There's an old hop repair. There's a song in the air. It's the music of busy men. Every plow in the land meets a happier hand. Cause the road is open again. There's an eager blue in the White House too. On the shoulder of our president air. With a lusty call telling one and all. Brother, do your share. There is gold in the blue, there is hope in the hearts of men. From the plain to the hill, from the farm to the mill, all the road is open again. Everybody sing it. There is a new day in view, there is gold in the blue, there is hope in the hearts of men. From the plain to the hill, from the farm to the mill, all the road is open. In 1931, MGM made this short to try and defeat daylight savings time and also publicize their latest film, Men and Bill, starring Marie Dressler and Wallace Beery. Men, look, 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 look. look at this. What, what is this daylight saving thing? Don't you know, not from daylight saving, that's a new idea they got to push the clock ahead so as to squeeze in another hour of daylight. I don't get you. What do you mean? Ah, oh, you dummy. Making the days longer and the nights shorter. You see, in this daylight saving thing, when it's five o'clock, it's six. When it's six, it's seven. When it's seven, it's eight. Oh, it's hold seven. on. Wait a minute. What do you think I am? An adding machine? <laughs> Take it slow. Now, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be to work every morning at six, ain't yeah. I? Yeah, and you get there at seven. Get there at seven? Mm-hmm. So with this daylight saving law, yes. I got to get up an hour ahead to get on the job at six o'clock, yes. which ain't six, but it's seven. Yes. And I don't get there until eight, <laughs> and I have to get up at five o'clock to do it. <laughs> sure, and so and they pay men to think up them ideas. <laughs> the studio felt that extra daylight in the evening would keep some of the movie going public at home. But during the Depression, when the fans wanted to see a film, they went day or night. Mae West comes to town and takes the town in a great big way. She stands New York on its ear, with the box office opening at 7.30 in the morning to accommodate the overflow crowds. Front page news in big New York dailies. In the lobby, more crowds and still more crowds. Outside, stretching way down around the 43rd Street side of the theater and far beyond the theater are the crowds waiting for their turn to get in to see the greatest of all Paramount shows. Just look at them all, and they're still coming. Newsreel coverage of a successful opening was a good way to sell a movie, and so were trailers that let the stars advertise their own films. I have a most important announcement to make. Most important. The Marx Brothers are retiring from the silver screen. That's right, folks. We're on our way. That's all right, folks, but well, where do we go from here? And so, to all of you, a fond farewell. Why, uh, we didn't know you cared. But since you do, we'll present to you songs and scenes from our first farewell picture, The Big Star. Where everything's a goodbye. Goodbye. By the end of the 30s, Hollywood was beginning to take on a military beat. The studios were beginning to change from showbiz ballyhoo to war propaganda. In 1941, Paramount went to Randolph Airfield 
to film I Wanted Wings and to make this promotional trailer. It shows how Hollywood and the government join hands for their mutual benefit. Yes, I've seen these young men go through this training program. Ray Milan, William Holden, Wayne Morris, Brian Don Levy, Veronica Lake and I spent many weeks here at America's West Point of the Air while we were making I Wanted Wings. We saw the men leave with the most complete and thorough training experience available in the whole world. It was a wonderful thing to have seen. Wonderful to know that in America today, there are thousands of young men training for the most exciting career in the world, to fly America's planes, to man America's first line of defense, the air. Young? Yeah. On the line right away. Solo. Okay. Huh? To encourage enlistment, films like this gave the impression that army life was the same as living in a college dorm. Fun and games all the way. Get out there and show them. Give them that old power play right over the center. And remember one thing, keep your head. Don't worry about me. All you gotta do is climb a little faster and climb a little further. That's all. That's right, Jeff, but don't get nervous. I'm not nervous! Oh, no? well, you got your flying suit on backward for then. Huh? Show business was getting into uniform, both on screen and off. And stars like Marlena Dietrich and Wallace Beery supported studio functions which honored the military and provided entertainment for a good cause like Greek war relief or bundles for Britain. When America entered the war, the movies became the nation's number one morale booster. And no star was more popular with the servicemen than Rita Hayworth the love goddess of the 40s. For the duration, Hollywood became a major part of the war effort, forming victory caravans which toured the country selling war bonds with big name stars like Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, and Bob Hope. Don't laugh and hope joke too much. People will die. What's the next line? Uh, Keep moving, you're a hell of a target. Uh, <laughs> What's the next line? Hey, wonderful! Don't dance all night with me Till the stars fade from above <laughs> They'll say it's all right with me Sinatra was a relative newcomer, but with so many stars at war, he advanced from band singer to movie star within a few years. It's Frankie! It's Frankie! Oh, 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 it's Frankie! During the war years, the need for movie entertainment was at an all-time high, with Hollywood selling over a billion dollars in tickets each year. Some theaters were open 24 hours a day, and they all made a pitch for the war effort. This time, take that box of mine in the bank is stuffed with bonds. I always went over the quarter, but this time I just can't afford it. I'm sorry, I can't afford it. Hold on, Joe. There's something I want to say to you. Are you talking to me? Yeah. And I want to give it to you quick. You know, we've got a lot of boys and girls fighting this war for us, and they're doing a great job. Maybe too great, because you're beginning to feel good again. You think peace is just around the corner, so now you're going to go in there and buy yourself a nice new suit of clothes. Been a good guy up to now. Yeah. But you're quitting. Quitting, Joe, before the job is over. War factories haven't shut down. They're still working the clock around to turn out the stuff we need to win this war. The Army hasn't quit. The Navy hasn't quit. I need to have the Marines. Or the girls. You're quitting right in the middle of the fight. Oh, listen now. You want to let those fellows and girls down. It's been a whole lot tougher for them than for you. Yo, what if they decided to let you down? What if they quit? What if they decided they couldn't afford anymore? 
What if the boys who've been taking it for you suddenly said that they'd gone over there quicker? That they fought a battle last week, last month, last night? That some other guy should take it for a change? For instance, you, Joe. The Nazis won't quit. The Japs won't quit. And you'd better not quit. That's what you can't afford. I never looked at it like that before. Well, maybe some other folks haven't either. But if we want to look those boys and girls in the eye when they come marching home, or if we want to look ourselves in the eye, we won't quit. Now, the fourth wall on I was on, and nobody can afford to buy that extra suit or that extra dress or those unrationed shoes. But what's more important is that we can all afford to buy those bonds. Let's all back the attack. In the long history of showbiz ballyhoo, one event stands out above the others. The coming of sound. Overnight, silent stars had to compete with stage performers who could speak beautifully. This was silent star Maine Murray's 1929 attempt to conquer the microphone in Peacock Alley. The only way you'll know which is the fool, which is the toy a dog, will be to just watch my feet. So then now, watch my step. No amount of publicity could hide the fact that some silent stars were on their way out. Not even the use of two-color Technicolor could save her from movie oblivion. Talkies ruined the careers of many silent stars, but contrary to popular belief, sound films were not new. In 1912, Thomas Edison combined his phonograph with the silent film for public approval. I put down into the merry old soul, but that's all a joke to see. That's all a joke to see. See, see. I cross the ninth avenue, I'm morbidly rapid, I'm filled to the muzzle with bile. Another man's death is a thing I detest, and I've never been known to smile. All musical talents and popular ballads are sent me disturbing in pain. If I find the offender a fix for the gender, you bet it won't happen again. For a while, it looked like the talkies were strictly an inventor's toy. Until 1926, when Warner Brothers, using more modern techniques, decided to gamble on the public's interest in sound. Note how the camera had to be isolated from the microphone to prevent camera noise from leaking onto the soundtrack. This is one of Warner Brothers' first sound shorts, featuring Wit and Bird, two singers who did little to advance the coming of sound. What the talkies needed was a dynamic personality who could capture the public's imagination. And in 1927, Al Jolson made his motion picture debut. When we got, went away, and though he slept for 20 years, who was it? She stopped way hard tears. She had no friends in the place. No one to embrace, but the landlord always left her with a smile on his face. Ah, who paid the rent for business? Rip and Winkle, when Rip and Winkle went away. Overnight, the movies were all talking, all singing, and all dancing. The musical was king, and performers from radio, nightclubs, theater, all got on the musical bandwagon. Everyone got in the act. Even silent star Gloria Swanson, who surprised the public by singing. Haven't got love like 
By 1929, movie theaters were selling 110 million tickets a week, nearly twice the amount for silent films two years earlier. Even the newsreels went musical. When George Gershwin opened the Manhattan Theater in New York, movie audiences in theaters all over the world could see and hear him play I Got Rhythm. Not even the stock market crash could diminish the public's interest in sound and the new personalities that talkies created. When Marlena Dietrich revealed the inner part of her thighs in the Blue Angel, Variety said she had plenty of SA for the BO. In show business jargon, that meant plenty of sex appeal for the box office. Dietrich wasn't the only newcomer to benefit from sound. The most popular musical star of the early 30s and the most imitated was Maurice Chevalier. There's me knows I love you. Love you. Every little bit that I feel in my heart seems to repeat what I felt at the sound. Each little sign tells me that I adore you. Louis, just to see and hear you is joy I never knew, but to be so near you thrills me through and through, anyone can see why I wanted your kiss, it had to be, but the wonder is this, can it be true? Someone like you could love me, Louis. Every little breeze seems to whisper, Louis. Birds in the trees seem to twitter, Louis. <laughs> Each little rose tells me it knows I love you. I love you. Every little bit that I feel in my heart seems to repeat what I felt at the start. Each little sigh tells me that I adore you, Louis. Just to see and hear you <laughs> is joy I never knew. But to be so near you thrills me through and through. Anyone can see why I wanted your kiss. It has to be, but the wonder is this. Can it be true? Someone like you could love me, Louise. During the Depression, the public seemed to need entertainment more than ever, and Hollywood found the musical extravaganza helped audiences forget their financial troubles.
In the early talkies, two-color Technicolor was highly publicized. But color films weren't new. This is Annabelle and her butterfly dance, first shown in 1896. It featured 17-year-old Annabelle Whitford in hand-painted color, which was used to represent the constantly changing colored gels in her stage act. This type of short, made by the Edison Company, was called a chaser because it was projected at the end of each vaudeville show for just one purpose, to chase one audience out and bring another one in. The movie musical made the chorus girl a major attraction, doing routines the average girl could learn with very little experience. change two steps. Remember the two steps I showed you last week? The double triple taps? Well, I want to interpolate those instead of the first two steps that you do. See, I'll do them for you so you can remember. Sam. All right, Sam. Everybody tap. If you were young and pretty, and you wanted to be in pictures, you might become one of the ladies of the chorus. Who always hears them say you're on? Who does the show depend upon? We, the ladies of the chorus. Who does their utmost to reveal that something known as sex appeal? We, the ladies of the chorus. Who keeps Cartier and Tiffany smiling with delight? Who tells the boys they must go home to mother every night? Who always keeps love notes and rich old bankers right? We, the ladies of the chorus. Who make old men of 93 feel like freshmen on a spree. We, we the, the ladies of the chorus. Who listens to the husband's tale of loving wives whose health has failed. We, the ladies of the chorus. In this musical salute to the chorus girl, the dancers performed a la Busby Berkeley who always staged his dance numbers for the benefit of the camera. Every chorus number had a male singer to introduce the girls. And in this case, the singer with the heavy makeup is Milton Burrow, who 15 years later became known as Mr. Television. There's nothing in this world I'd rather do. Clink, clink, clink. Lift your glasses high, don't you think, 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 that I'm a lucky guy. Sometimes the chorus girl was used to promote a political point of view. In New Deal Rhythm, Buddy Rogers and some patriotic Koreans turned the Depression into a musical extravaganza. New Deal Rhythm, get up, get up, get out, get into it, put all your students into it. Get it with a New Deal Rhythm, we're on the up and up and yelling it, from post to post they're spelling it, and our A.
Showbiz Ballyhoo did an outstanding job of selling the movie musical. But there was one aspect of movie making that wasn't publicized. The bloopers. In the heyday of the motion pictures, no studio wanted the audience to think that stars made mistakes. After all, they were gods and goddesses. But sometimes, producers and editors privately enjoyed collecting classic outtakes for their own amusement. Okay. Still running. Is camera, that's one of us. I thought it? camera, you see, was there starting. I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry, darling. Here we go. Now, we might work up a match with one of your own boys. Create local interest. All we need is a fellow with weight enough can uh, learn a couple of uh, uh, lines uh, and... Uh, can't stand it, I tell you. I feel like taking his place and waiting for a stream of hot juice to shock, shock you into kingdom. God damn it. Start again. Go ahead. Listen, baby. I know everything there is to know about wrestling. I can promote a match from Podunk to the Garden. I can't remember the line. God damn it. Good morning, Miss Ann. I was wondering if I might speak to Mr. H Mr. Hearn. No, I... What? Bust my bustle. That's the right smart idea. I'm not waiting for money. I'll tell you... <laughs> Son of a... Well, wait till he sees me fly. He won't worry then. It's just a question of flying. Or that you're a damn good fly. <laughs> <laughs> But I hear you mouse. Let somebody rub this man here that knows how. All right, Sean. <laughs> Mr. President, <clears throat> Mr. McCombs. How do you do, Mr. President? A pleasure indeed, sir. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, Annie, you handle that cigar like a monkey handles a coconut. I beg your pardon. Mr. President. <laughs> you seem to have spilled your drink. Lovely party, isn't it? What? Schmuck. Can't take any chances now. Chances? What's all the emergency about? I just had a baby in the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my mother wrote in the flyleaf to my, my, my dear little Gabrielle. That means, uh, nuts. Here's to the very holes of Montezuma. Of course, I can't move my head, because if I do, my entire goddamn wig should come off. <laughs> help me. Help me, dear God, help me. I'm caught on his side. <laughs> I'm always bad luck to men. Kind of a bitch. You haven't got a chance. Why, you dirty... Say, just a minute, this is supposed to be my dance. What are you doing here? How can we find out? What can we do? Hmm. Better leave that to me, huh? But you won't do anything foolish. Oh, I'm sorry. God damn it. Pick it up. Disappeared? Yes, surprise, eh? Well, what happened to her? Well, that's for you to tell us. Listen, I've told you everything I know. I'm good. Well, I have... he thought you liked beer. I do like beer. But out here, you can go for walks and, and get that fine, cool air on your chest. And go swimming in little pools and... Holy Christ, Stop. then where am I? Son of a... No, I haven't been in an apartment like this for a long time. It's been two years since I was in New York. How does it look to you? About the same as any other place these days, but good. You're looking blooming. Oh, I'm fine. You been getting any lately? Overtime, you mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're looking blooming. Oh, I'm fine. Just fine. Well, I don't know whether you've laid any... Lay. Oh, eggs. You know, it's none of my goddamn... Bill, darling! Hello. <laughs> Sally, I want you to meet Van Johnson, president of the Actors Guild. How do you do? <laughs> Must be difficult for a man who has spent a lifetime stirring up a certain sort of goddamn knowledge that does. Uh, <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, 
your gun. <laughs> Look, I hope you don't mind regret a goddamn regret having. I hope you don't mind. I meant to tell you that if I got the line right, I was gonna build a laboratory <laughs> in the goddamn port. Son of a bitty, son of a bitty, son of a bitty, 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 gun. <laughs> you thought I was gonna say as this son of a bitch, didn't you? <laughs> God damn it! 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 Oh, 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 oh nuts! <laughs> Showbiz Bally, who has come a long way from the days when the stars were afraid of ruining their image. Today's performers reveal all, or almost all, and the glamour and the mystery of yesterday is gone forever. The new stars discuss the very things that the old Hollywood tried to hide. Drugs, alcohol, adultery are now casual topics for newspapers, magazines, and books, and of course, talk shows. But Bally, who is still with us, and always will be, as long as audiences go to the movies, watch TV, and wonder what it's like to be a star. I'll see you at the movies. Oh, my God. We can get one of them up here. George Burns and oh, Miss Gracie Allen. Oh, well, Gracie, say things terribly. Oh, yes. Well, I had something. Well, you know. You it. Well, now, take it, now, take it Did you? Well, what is that? Yeah. Hello. Tell me when you're ready. Huh? Take the word Temple and you have a place to worship. Take the name Shirley Temple and you have a person to worship. And I certainly do, and I wish her all the luck and the success in the world tonight. Hello, Lawyerville. Did anyone say tonight that they were glad they were here? Only one person. It's a strange preview, this. Is that right? Yeah, only one person. Well, then it wouldn't hurt for me to say that I'm glad that I'm here. That's certainly it. Well, I am glad that I'm here. Hello, everybody. We're looking forward to see a great picture tonight. I hope that, uh, I know that Eddie Cantor will be very, very funny. I hope he is. Of course, not too funny. I don't want to have to hate him, too. Ida, I want you to tell these good people, uh, who is your favorite actor? Who do you think? Well, who? Paul uh, Muni. Yeah, all right, you get Paul Muni to buy your coat after this. I want to be in movies. 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 We want to be in movies. Oh, you want to be in movies. Want your picture on the screen. Well, it's not an easy game winning fame as a movie queen. If you want to be an actress, huh? It's more trying than you know. Living at your public's call, giving all for your studio. Appointments here, appointments there, no sooner than you wake up with wardrobe, stills, and makeup. Oh, what a time they take up. They fix your gown, they dress your hair, they primp you up to show you the work's enough to throw you. Your mother would know you. So you want to be in movies like a lot of others do. Well, just take a look at me and you'll see what a girl goes through. So you want to be in movies, well, the laugh's on you. Have you ever printed that? So help me out. Then who are you to tell me what to print? I'm running this column and I'm taking orders from nobody, see? Now get out. And if you know what's good for you, you'll keep your dirty nose out of my business. Go on, blow.
Sure, you'll fix it up. With some more of your rotten publicity, I suppose. I never want my name in your column again. I don't want your money. Just lay off me, understand? Lay off me! Where is this public nuisance who announced he would be here in spite of anything we could do to keep him out? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, where is Alvin Roberts? Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Mr. Alvin Roberts himself in person as advertised. <laughs> It'll be a boy at the Reginald Taylor's on Fifth Avenue, period. They can tell by the heartbeats, you dope. The Thomas H. Lehigh Steel Carnigans, who were so quietly married late this summer, anticipate a blessed event. Miss Dorothy Lane, singer in the Midnight Review, anticipates a blessed event without benefit of clergy. <laughs> I bought it for you. I knew you'd like it. John, I want you to come home with me. Now, this is exactly what we want. A perfect love nest. Oh, quite, quite. <laughs> Interesting bed, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? What on earth are you talking about? Eric and me. Lovers. We're not going to marry. What? What do you mean? Janet, stop talking like I that. I don't believe it. You're joking. Indeed, we're not. We're going away tonight. Janet, you don't know what you're doing. Now, listen to me, you two. You're going to be married at once. We love each other too much to be married. Now, calm yourself, John. Calm myself, knowing that my wife may have been unfaithful to me, the only woman I ever loved. Well, what about me? Well, after all, she's the mother of my child. What's that got to do with it? Well, I love her as a husband loves his wife, and you as a man loves a woman. Oh, you just wanted to make me jealous, didn't you? I don't want to make you anything. Don't be so conceited. Eric is going to be my love. You can keep right on with Charlotte. You've managed to keep your little affairs secret enough. Maybe you could give me a few hints. <laughs> I keep getting letters like this all the time. But my real name is Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine, not Marty. <laughs> you know, the big hope of an actor, after such a success as Marty, is to find another story just as good. I was mighty lucky to be selected by MGM to join some fine players in making the catered affair. It's by the same author as Marty, and uh, it's another wonderful story full of laughs and romance and, and real people. For instance, this is Aggie Hurley, the mother. Betty Davis plays the part. Daughter Jane is Debbie Reynolds, and she does the best acting of her career. I play Tom Hurley, a role that I hope will please you as much as Marty. And where do you see Barry Fitzgerald as Uncle Jack? I told you later. Rod Taylor is a real find. Debbie and he are perfect together. I don't know. 
I don't know what I believe. You mean I never told you what I feel about you? Yes. Oh, yes. But don't ever stop telling me. <laughs> but to me, the heart of this picture is much more than just the story of a young girl's wedding. It also uncovers the deepest feelings of real people in a real world. Oh, by the way, Tom, you'd be pleased to hear that old Casey and old Regan will be coming to the reception. Uh, Mrs. Rafferty, of course, will be there, too. Three more, huh? Well, of course, I'd pay for them. Did you ask Mrs. Rafferty? I did. But we don't know her. Well, she don't know you, but she'll come. You know what? Everyone's invited to this wedding. You too. We're sure you're going to have a good time. for the future. I've never met a girl yet who wouldn't lie just for the sake of lying. If you ask them for a date, they got seven dates a week. Well, you're one girl in a million. Well, thanks. Of course, I'm exaggerating. If you're in love with a man, sow a few oats. Why the devil should the boys have a monopoly on wild oats? Laurie, I'm afraid I'm going to lose him. No, you won't. You know what I think. I think it's time for you to resort to female tactic number one. I could have been in the Philippines right now. But no, I had to let you rope me in. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Be 
marry. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, where is the book that'll review you? Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, oh, there's a guy going in business for himself. But we'll not start the review off with the customary hello. hello. Metro hello. Goldwyn Mayor proudly presents. You took the words right out of my mouth. And that's very unsanitary. Proudly presents. Where are the girls? Never mind the pl 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 The most exciting, the most amazing, the most entertaining motion picture of the year. I speak of two sisters from Boston. Tonight. You're telling me this is going to be the third time I've seen it. Well, I've seen every picture Betty Davis has made. I wouldn't miss this for anything. You know, I like this picture more each time I see it. Everybody's raving about it. Here it comes, that scene I was telling you about. You shouldn't have come and I shouldn't have seen you. I wonder what you think of me, really. You know what I think of you. I'm young. Don't you think I like to drink and dance and go to parties like other people do? Every time I see you, I feel like you're... That's not true. Anyway, I'm tired of being your... your haven. She's the only actress on the screen today who can play a part like this. And isn't George Brent wonderful? You know, ever since Dark Victory and the Old Maid, I've been dying to see them together again. And Mary Astor. What a revelation she is. One of the most attractive things about you to me has always been that you understood women. Now you're going to try and understand me, aren't you? You see, she's in love with George Brent, too. And she's not going to let Betty stand in the way. And when those two get together, the sparks really fly. He never loved you as he loved me. You were second choice. You caught him on the rebound. Why did you lie to him? Oh, Sandy, you're not going to tell Pete, are you? You see, you're afraid. You don't dare tell him how you've lied to him. We'll go away together somewhere secretly. You say no one else knows, no one else will know. I'll make all the arrangements take care of everything. I'm going to get out of here. No, you can't keep me here. I won't stay. I won't stay. I thought that you'd never come back, that, that perhaps you'd marry and stay away all for years. Perhaps you'd die. I hoped you would. How do you like it? Oh, it's marvelous. And you haven't seen anything yet. The real surprises are coming.
attractive, isn't she? Mm, I guess so. She like that type. What you don't? Oh, you're so right. Tall, slinky type. That's for me. Is it boy that makes a man go on and on, huh? Keep moving and living and hoping. What is it, boy? A dream inside you. Every man's got one. And I got mine. To find high Barbary. Alec, will you write to me often? What do you think? <laughs> I think that I love you very much. And I want to tell you and tell you and tell you. We've loved each other all our lives, haven't we? I told you I had a great show, and I have. It's always the way. I got the show, I got the music, I got the cast, I got the theater, all rearing to go, and it's the old, old story. Money. I'm not kidding. I'll give him the money. He'll have it in his office at half past ten tomorrow morning. Where are you going to get $15,000? We'll make those guys pay for their fun right through the checkbook. Underneath your... Well, what do you know about me underneath? Huh? Uh, uh, I mean... Uh... Oh, I know what you mean, yo, sugar. <laughs> you watch out, I'm falling in love with you. <laughs> and oh boy, when love comes at my age. <laughs> Guess who? Show. Why aren't you out there doing your number? Do you want to ruin me? Oh, Brad, what are we going to do? 